Hey, entrepreneurs, are you trying to make bigger profits in your small business? Like many of us, I'm sure you're feeling it. Business is hard. And now more than ever, you need to have a plan to make sure your business not only survives, but thrives. I'm Marcia Reiner. I'm a business strategist on a mission. And I've helped tons of small business owners to establish and implement a tangible plan that guarantees sustainable profitability and it guides your growth. I want to share strategies that I've earned and learned with you on today's Profit with a Plan podcast. I'm really excited to have my guest on today, Brian Olson. He's a business strategist, a revenue acceleration expert, and a speaker and trainer. As the co-founder of One Broken Cog, a conscious business accelerator, Brian shares the mission to accelerate positive change in the world by helping other business leaders identify and fix the broken cogs that are preventing growth and holding them back from achieving their objectives. Prior to founding One Broken Cog, Brian was a perennial award winner in the ad tech world using programmatic ad exchanges. We're going to have to explain that one to help publishers sell and monetize their traffic. During this time, Brian led his team to a record-breaking $1 million per day in just over a year. Due to his effectiveness and expertise in this field, he spoke at numerous industry events and trained other professionals in his methods. At One Broken Cog, Brian leads by example by showing his clients how to effectively scale their sales team by implementing custom processes and systems, establishing initial and ongoing training, and developing leaders from within. One Broken Cog's prep proprietary sales automation system has helped companies increase their sales revenue for clients from startups to established businesses. By eliminating tactical tasks and allowing them to spend uh, the majority of their time closing. Brian lives in Simi Valley in California. He enjoys family barbecues, swimming, and going to Disneyland with his kids. And of course, he's a foodie. Welcome to Profit with a Plan podcast, Brian. Thank you for having me, Marcia. It's a pleasure. Absolutely. Okay, so um, you got to answer that question. The the programmatic. Um, what was programmatic, it? Programmatic. Programmatic. Right. Real time bidding. You know, I work for a company. It's interesting. I work for a company called OpenX. They were the second largest ad exchange next to Google at the time, and I had no business being there. I had no experience. I remember I was introduced to this company by a good friend of mine who I worked with in the media uh, space. At a company called Interactive Corp, you know, they own Match.com, you know, About.com, Urban Spoon, you know, those big back right. in the day. So when I got in this business, I was sitting in this big sales conference and it is big screen. Everybody was there. They had offices from San Francisco, New York. I mean, all over the place, Germany and you know, England. And I said, Brian, we really want you to get started because this is going to give you a high level overview of the industry, of the business. I said, great. So I'm sitting there and they're going through all of these terms and everything. I'm sitting up there going, man, have you ever seen those news conferences where they have United Nations sitting out there where they all have those earpieces. And the earpieces are basically translating there. I, th I need one of those earpieces. I have no idea what they're talking about. It's as if they were speaking Greek. It was unbelievable. But I remember somebody telling me, Brian, listen, these business owners don't care about any of that fluff. Keep it simple. Talk to them like they're in third grade. They will get it. They will buy and you will make money. And as you see the results there, a million dollars a day net revenue. That's net revenue, by the way. Wow. And uh, of course, we definitely blew that up. Wow, that's awesome. Well, thanks for explaining. And I think that's it with any sales conversation you're having with anybody is you've got to get rid of the, the, the googly gop, the, the term, the terminologies that we use, the acronyms, the things like that. And you've got to speak to them like they're your grandmother or a five-year-old. But you can't talk down to them, but you've got to have that conversation with it. And so it sounds like you were super successful taking your sales team and having those kind of results. So what do you think the number one thing you did to get those kind of results? What was that one shift? Well, first to answer your question, I don't think I actually answer what programmatic oh. is, but if you'd like to know, it is basically, it's pretty boring, but what it is basically is when you go online on your phone or if you're on YouTube, you see those commercials, skip, right? Skip those things, get them out of my face. <sighs> when you're on the phone, these stupid ads come up or when you're on your browser, and of course, hopefully you have an ad blocker because those things are really obnoxious. But basically, these publishers or websites or mobile apps or you know video providers, 
they want you to see their advertisement, right? So they mm -hmm. bid in real time, hence the RTB, they call real-time bidding. It's in a programmatic fashion through an ad server. And they basically set a floor price for their inventory, right? And they will set, let's say 50 cent floor price. And people will come and, you know, advertisers, as an example, will look at cookie data, user data, things of that nature and bid up. Like it's like an online auction, right? And it happens in milliseconds. And of course you can whitelist and blacklist and all that boring stuff. But basically I set my floor price at 50 cents. That's the lowest I'm possibly going to accept for that eyeball. Hopefully we get five bucks, right? And it's measured per thousand views, but that's really what programmatic is. It's like an online auction where you're connecting buyers and sellers for that real estate, uh, which is their website, their mobile app, their video application, you know, Hulu or whatever it may be. Wow. Okay. So I had no idea that you're bidding for, um, for people to be able to see the ads that you're rolling through there, but that's, that's really, that's really interesting. So is that, is that the field you're still in right now? Or are no, you, are you not. working? Yeah, no, it isn't. But to answer your other question, as far as the number one factor, it's very hard to tell, you know, I think when I first got into that, I think maybe my lack of experience was what took me over the top. So many people want to sound so important, you know, when I would walk through the halls, you know, everybody wanted to impress you with their jargon and their verbiage and how much they knew. And, and nobody really cared about that. Right. So I was the first person in the office every day at, you know, between six and 7 a.m. So I got to know the CEO just simply because of the fact that my friend and I were the only ones there and he would come in very early. So they call the company Open X because nobody had offices. Everything was open. We were all out together collaborating. The culture was phenomenal. I mean, massages every Thursday and Friday, chiropractors every Wednesday, catered meals Monday, Wednesday, Friday, video games, ping pong tables, snacks, you know, everything. I mean, you, all the perks. It was basically Silicon Valley light. It was Google-esque in that regard. Mm -hmm. so I, you know, so I think it was, it was partly really wanting to honor that person that brought me in because, you know, with that company, I saw later on how hard it was to get into not only the space, but that company, very, very difficult. You know, you had to interview with many, many people and then they give you a unanimous thumbs up to be able to make it. But, uh, and of course the stay was a whole different ball game. They had very, very lofty expectations, very, very high goals. And so I think it was a matter of work ethic, adaptability, really latching onto the need to have. And, and I think it was, it was a very strategic sale. It was, we had you know, three service levels and product levels and it was, what do I sell them on first? Do I go all in? Do I just go here? And then it's a matter of expectations. There was a lot of client churn because people would over promise and under deliver. So my thing was, I'm thinking long-term. I want to hook them in here, show them promise and upsell throughout. So I led the organization of referral business, which was very, very good. And I should have done this podcast. I have a big mantle I put up recently with all my awards in it. I should have done it so you can, it was facing the back, but. Right, that would have been awesome. God, people would go by my desk and say, man, what, it was just, they would look like I was like a zoo animal. There would be awards all over the place. Oh my God, you know? So it sounds like your, your, your skill set was more in finding somebody or getting them in, in a lower price item to get them started and then moving them up to the next one. Or is that, is that what, is that the path that you took with them? Because if you're getting the repeat and the referral business, then how are you doing that? Yeah, everybody, it's, it's very tough because that whole ecosystem is completely different than any traditional sale. On the ad exchange, you're basically paying them on a rev share basis. So they're selling their inventory for a certain amount, and we're taking a, a cut of that money. So it's basically you're making them money. So that sale, that initial sale was, well, what can you do for me, right? It's, you know, Google is giving me a $2 CPM. You're only giving me one. Well, if Google's only filling 20%, we're filling 60%, right? It's a little bit different. So it's all about managing expectations. But yeah, I mean, we had an ad server where it was a SaaS cost where they're basically paying us a monthly fee depending on their traffic volume. And, you know, obviously there's a, there's a cost associated with it, but it balanced, it was a yin and yang to that ad exchange. So sometimes you would hook them on the exchange and show them the value, the relationship, the service level quality, and then you would pivot and upsell them on that ad server or vice versa. Right. And then we had a whole another, you know, litany of other offerings that we had too, which I won't bore you with, but, but no, it really was understanding that person's use case, knowing where to slot them in, and really being an advocate for their business and thinking long-term. In the beginning, I think we only had about six weeks with these clients. They further extended that to six months, knowing the fact that these people test. In today's economy, most everybody, they want to dip their toe in the water. Everybody, it's always a free trial or it's, hey, mm -hmm. it's try this 90 days or let me just give you a little bit of my budget. Show me a return, then we'll dial it up, right? right. So that's how, and there was no contract. So, so the onus was on us to perform 
because there was skin in the game, right? We had to make them look and perform for them to keep their business. So they could pull their tags at any moment. So it was in our best interest to perform for them. And I took that seriously. I was in the UI every morning, every noon and every evening. And I would provide proactive feedback. I was always first to respond to any inquiries because we know how rare those are, right? And uh, yeah, just, just you know, out hustling, out working. Sometimes, listen, I always say, hustle beats talent when talent doesn't hustle. You know, you could be the smartest person in the room. If you're not working hard enough, you're going to get lapped. And I'm living proof of that. So I yeah. definitely was not the smartest. I definitely had the least amount of experience. Um, I should, for all intents and purposes, I shouldn't have been there, but I, I ate their lunch. I drank their milkshake and I have the, 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 uh, the glass gold and, and plaques to prove it. Wow. So how does that translate for small business owners now um, to be able to use that kind of drive and information in their business? What, what do you think that could, you could share with that? Well, you know, it's, it's, I basically, it was funny after that. So I'll, I'll answer this in a roundabout way. At the end of my tenure there, I was offered a promotion and it was a big honor for me because there was a very tight knit unit of a team. When I got there, they were like the, they were up there. They were, they were the, rock the stars. absolutely. And they, they let you know that, right. They were the ones whining and dying in the clients. I mean, they were the ones and they had to vote unanimously and that team never changed. I mean, that team was all, nobody really ever joined that team. So my boss came to me and said, Hey, you're going to be promoted into that team. So they all voted unanimously to take me. Right. But at that time, another good friend of mine, uh, who was working at a different company, a lead gen business, he called me up and said, Hey, you know, we're starting a, a, a business, a software business over here. And we need somebody with ad tech experience to come in here, programmatic experience in here and to get this thing off the ground and build it up. And man, this was a very tough decision. I mean, extremely, extremely tough. And I ended up saying, you know what, you only live once, man. And I want to, if I'm going to go out, I'm going to go out on top. So I decided right. to leave and, and, you know, go ahead and do that. And I did, and it taught me a ton. But the reason I mentioned that is because everybody told me in that industry, once you build a name for yourself, you want to go out and be a consultant. Well, and at the time, you know, I shoved it. I, I kind of shucked up. Yeah, it's great. But let me build myself first, right? I mean, that's a great, I'll, you know. And I had no idea what it meant until later on. When I was working at this place, building up this team, I would receive inquiries. And hey, listen. We know your name. I mean, apparently it's a small world, this programmatic world that you live in. And we know we know what you've done. We need you to guide us and help us mm -hmm. build a team, or we need your you to consult with us and give us advice, feedback, whatever. So you know, I'll do it. Why not? So I did that. And it turned into it, it the requests kept coming in more frequently, and the results were there. And you know, I just kind of took it as a nonchalant, okay, I'll figure this out. But I'm focused on this, I'm focused on corporate America. Well, long story short, that company sold. And, you know, so I guess I did my job, right? We evaluated it, sold. So I was at a crossroads and I went into another consulting gig. And there's another guy there who was from New York, New Jersey, and we kind of clicked and we kept in touch ever since. And, you know, and I basically, what I did, Marcia, was I took a lot of the culture from those companies, which I, you know, I've had mentors, a lot of mentors in life. I mean, mm -hmm. the story of my career is people taking a chance on me saying, listen, Brian, mm -hmm. you don't have the experience, but I really see potential in you and I'm going to take a chance. And luckily enough for me, you know, I over delivered for them and I really, really, you know, took it beyond anywhere they, you know, beyond their expectations. And that's probably what drove me to that last position was a person that took a chance on me. I want to make that person proud. And I did. Right. But, um, I took that culture and the structure and, of course, my instincts, depending on each individual business, and I integrated it. And my thing was, listen, is it going to be accepted? Is it going to work in this environment, right? And as long as you have a certain foundation, you can build upon that foundation like we talked about earlier. And I did, and it worked. It really, really worked. And I went on this really extensive project, and my partner, my now partner, uh, would keep in touch with me. And he was kind of like my coach throughout that process. Right. Because, you know, obviously you're in it and somebody from the outside can really see from the outside and provide, you know, guidance because of that. And I want to make sure, hey, are my instincts correct, right? I want to run ideas by this person. So, he, you know, finally the pandemic hit and he said, hey, listen, you know, why don't we just do this? We've been talking this for a long time. We have such good synergy here. We're aligned in our approach and our thoughts. And, you know, we've had the same similar experiences. Why don't we do this? And, you know, the timing was right. And we said, you know what? Absolutely. Let's go ahead and, and, and take off and, and make this thing happen. And there you go. We've been doing it. We haven't looked back ever since. Wow. What a story. I mean, and it's all about connections and talk about having 
having the luck of people taking that faithful step in you. Um, that doesn't happen very often. So that's something that is, is quite unusual. They normally want all the experience and all that, you know, all, all the, all the force stuff, you know, coming in first, you know, oh, show me what you can do. And, and then we'll take, you know, then we'll bring you on. So, so that's really interesting. Um, for as for small business owners, so it sounds like, you know, you were big in the corporate, you were going, you had these great ideas, you outperformed every opportunity that was put in front of you, which is fabulous skill. How can you translate that kind of information so that people that are working on their own business can maybe take some of those ideas and put it into their business? Yeah, no, it's, it's a great question. I think that what we found, you know, John and I, when we first started was, you know, hey, listen, once we start talking to people and working with people, we're going to see a recurring theme, kind of like the theme we just talked about, the fact that people took a risk with me, and it rarely happens, but it's been a recurring theme for me, right, which is great, mm -hmm. I'm going to ride it till the wheels fall off, right? Sure. But, um, you know, I'll tell you, we found, you know, a couple of things. One is that the greatest problem we're seeing for our clients and for business owners is that they don't understand what the real problem is. Think about that for a minute, right? Their greatest problem is not I being able to identify the actual problem in their business. And there could be multiple problems, right? So I'm sure you've seen the quote on the website, but you know, Albert Einstein was asked, you know, if you had an hour to solve the world's problems, what would you do? He said, I spent 40, you know, 59 minutes identifying the problem and one minute solving it, right? Because nobody's really trained on identifying it. And People are very reactive. It's like this knee-jerk reaction. We see it in sports, right? That, yeah. oh my God, this team has been built. We spent so much money on this team and they lost two games in a row. We got to change everything. Fire the coach and mess with the lineup. And, you know, they, they instead of adjusting, they just go ahead and throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? And it's, it's crazy, right? So our thing is really understanding the problem. But to answer your original question, it's, it's very tough, right? In life, there really are no absolutes other than death and taxes. So each business is completely different and unique. And our approach is just that, right? We want to get in there and really understand. Now, now, given there are structural foundational changes you can make at a high level to build on, but when you talk about getting your hands dirty in the nitty gritty and really solving some of these problems, it's really going to depend on that business because, again, everybody's different. It could be B2B, it could be B2C, it could be an online business, e-commerce, could be a service business. I mean, a subscription model. You never know. So we want to get in there and really assess the problem and, you know, a lot of times, look, people come to us with an issue and. It's usually not it's, the issue that they realize, yeah, right? Yeah. It's, it, look, there is an issue. Absolutely. But they don't understand what's causing it. Mm -hmm. And they don't understand what's the byproduct of it and what's coming out of it. And that's really what we're, you know, we've had people contract us and say, here, our problem is X. And we say, okay, absolutely. So we get in there and we work on it and say, listen, if we don't address these other things, it's not going to matter if you fix this because it's going to fall apart. Nothing is aligned properly. Right. It's kind of like the car. Listen, I can fix my fan belt, but if the radiator is busted, who cares? You know, I mean, it doesn't really matter, right? The thing's still right. not going to run. It's still not right. going to run. You're not going to get from A to, A to Z. So really, you know, I think it, for me, it's all about balance, right? I mean, it's, it's, you know, stay humble or be humble, but it's a balance, like in my personal approach from confidence and humility, understanding, yes, we've had past successes. Yes, we understand what success looks like, but every problem is unique. And we come into each assignment with a lot of respect and hard work and dedication, right? And we never rest on past laurels and past victories because, um, you know, stay humble, like I said, or be humble, right? So right. for me, it's really a matter of that business savviness and learning from the failures around us and learning from the successes. Like I mentioned, we took an amazing culture and we took all the structure and the amazing systems and processes and it definitely translated well into the assignments that we've had. But it's also learning from the people that have failed, right? And it's understanding why they failed and the reason behind that. And to understand that, you know, people are people and there's micro and there's macro. And when you look at numbers to really understand, like I always equate it to like kids, right? I have a three-year-old and a six-year-old and you tell them something and it's, and what do they, what do they say when, you know, you answer the question, why? And then you answer yeah, it again, right. well, why, right? So it's really understanding, peeling the onion all the way back to really find out that why. And to really identify the root cause. And a lot of times, once you do that, these people, it's just like a, it's like a light bulb. It's an aha moment. They get it. And they're feeling the pain. They don't understand the root cause of the pain. So you go to the doctor and say, man, my knee really hurts. I have no idea what it is. Well, what happened? You know, I don't know. I have no clue. And then they do a deep dive and they figure out here is the cause of the pain. Here's how we're going to attack it. Here's how we're going to solve it, right? 
Yeah, that's that's super valuable because so many business owners um, go and try and fix things without understanding the root cause. Um, I think that that's, I mean, I we've spoken about it before. I mean, a lot of the challenges I face, they want something over here and don't realize until we, you know, open up their kimono that it's over here. And once you fix this, then everything falls into place. So I love that. Is there a, um, a system that you guys have actually developed that allows you to narrow it down and get to that point faster? Is there something that the business owner listening might be able to start look for? You know, if, if it's A, then you have to check B, C, D, and E before you go back and, you know, get back to A again. Is there any kind of process that you use? Yeah, no, absolutely. We look at all the areas of the business. So we look at uh, sales, marketing, hiring and onboarding, HR, you know, we look for uh, the, you know, the alignment, right? We call it our broken cogs assessment. So we do have a system when we go into a business and we go down the line and, you know, any great salesperson knows it's all about discovery, right? When you're trying to sell somebody something, you have to figure out what are their aspirations? What are they trying to accomplish? And what are their afflictions? What are they trying to overcome? And, mm -hmm. you know, you obviously, because that's what you're quantifying, you're defining what it is they're actually buying, what it is they're actually, and you try to paint a picture of the brand new world that they're going to be living in, you know, that's what right. it is. So yeah, we absolutely do have a system for that. We go through it. And um, at the end, you know, luckily we've been mostly great at it. Sometimes we miss something. And then when we're in the business, like where our hands are dirty and we're in there doing the job, we find other things. You know, there's only so much you can do from the outside looking in, but once you're in and you're experiencing the pain, and you're experiencing along with them like a day in the life is, which is what we've done on future assignments. We've actually, our past assignments, we've actually lived in the life of some of the people that have been affected by this. And we definitely find it out very, very quickly once we're in their shoes. Great. So, so do you find that it's more often, most often a people problem or a um, maybe a system problem or something that they're a, a process that the business is doing? Where do you think it leans a little bit more towards? Yeah, I'd say 60% people, 40% uh, processes and systems, because usually the person is going to, uh, you know, be the reason why there's a lack of processes and systems, right? right? So a lot of times, I don't know if you've experienced this, but you know, you have this thing called the ivory tower syndrome, where you have the, you know, upper level executives, not really, I mean, you've probably seen the show Undercover Boss, right? Where you have these CEOs that go down and actually spend time with the, the little people. And yeah. they realize, wow, I had no idea this was going on in my business. And it's every episode, right? Mm -hmm. Because they have middle management that present them reports and nobody understands what those reports mean or why it's happening. Right. So when you talk about micro macro, it's like you have the team, like the, the company in and of itself, right? And you have goals and you have these metrics you're trying to hit, but you have the people within them and that's the micro. And, right. you know, obviously, like we talked about, leadership is all about relationships. You have to understand that, you know, it's like a sales funnel. Where are we getting caught up? This person is losing deals at this step. So we obviously right. have to work on it. If you don't know what that step is, you can identify it. Well, gee, this guy's sales math is off. I wonder why. Well, if you have those weekly one-on-ones, if you're reviewing metrics, if you're doing role plays, if you're evaluating that person, if you actually know that person, you're in rapport and they're sharing with you openly what's going on with them, you're going to get it, right? So there's more than just a number. So yeah, it's, it, there's definitely a people problem and there's definitely a disconnect between you know, the rank and file and the upper level executives, and it's a middle management problem. And they mm. just don't, they really don't understand the full spectrum of what's going on. All they see is the bottom line. So they know they're hurting. They just don't understand why they're hurting. Mm. That makes total sense. You know, they, they, they teach you that as the leader, you should be overseeing and not doing it. But sometimes you get that disconnect where you're such a leader or in your mind, you're a leader that you forget about what the bottom people are actually doing. So getting involved and staying involved or at least being aware, you don't have to go in there and tighten the bolts, but you need to understand is he, is he tightening it three times or is he tightening it two times? You know, you got to understand the process in there. So that's, that's really a big aha. I know as businesses start to scale and really have that kind of um, uh, pieces going in there that they're, that they can, they can get lost. They can, they can forget about the, the pieces that, that they were doing originally when they started the company. So well, I'll tell you this, the greatest fear, I'll tell you, we put the fear in the hearts of men, because I'll tell you this, we had a project. It was a, a, unbelievable. It was like baptism by fire, trial by fire. It was just the biggest mess I've ever involved in. But I'll tell you this, the biggest fear, this company has seven locations, managers all over the place, completely unaligned. I mean, nobody got along. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, it was like a episode of Real Housewives. Every time you got a meeting together, it was like, you know, you wondering who's going to pull whose hair out. But I'll tell you this, 
talk about disconnection from the, the top down. We installed a piece of software. This is a great advice to anybody listening out there. It's called Office Vibe, right? And there's other softwares too. Basically what it is, it's asking feedback for employees you know, about their manager, about the company. It's completely huh. anonymous, right? right? So as we're presenting this, you know, we've already presented this in CEO. He's totally cool with this. And we're seeing this meeting, you can see everybody start to, you know, start yeah, to sweat sweating. because they're, they, <laughs> why are they sweating, right? They're fearful of what those people are going to say, because think about it. They are the buffer between their employees, their staff, and those upper level executives, yeah. their boss, who's the CEO or the VP, whoever else. Now it's like, I'm going directly to the people. I'm not using you as a buffer because there's something off here. I'm not trusting this. I'm going to go directly to these people. I'm going to get the feedback I want completely anonymous and i'm going to make those changes based on what i hear and it put fear in the hearts of managers everywhere out there i'm telling you office vibe is a great tool anonymous feedback you're going to get the real dirt on what's happening in your business good bad or ugly and it opens up a lot of eyes and it's it's, it's absolutely amazing it's very effective too yeah well it, it, you have to be you have to be aware of what's going on in your business so this is this has been really valuable so office vibe huh interesting i'm gonna have to uh try that out i've got a couple of uh a couple of clients right now that are having employee problems and um i'm thinking it's that communication level that is breaking down but you know you can only if you're fearful of your job you can only say so much to the person above you um, and then if you can say it anonymously, then it'll go right into the ears and, and have it have the, the, the results um, much better. So I'm liking that. Great tools. All yeah. Right, what's so the guarantee? What's the guarantee? Also, if you're telling somebody in a, in a meeting, you're what's the guarantee they're actually going to go and voice those concerns? Somebody else. I mean, they can just, oh, yeah, great. Note to self. Fantastic. Sure. And yeah. then put it in the file, right? The, the file, which is the trash can and go away. So, no, it's, it's a great tool. Yeah, I love that. And 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 I think that's I think that's it. Um I had a I had a guest on um my podcast the other day and we were talking about setting clear expectations and you know, if you can't have that open line of communication then then your expectations are never going to be met because you didn't tell that person what you liked and the same for the opposite. It's it, the 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 communication runs both ways. And so setting that is is super important. Brian, this has been really good information and I know it's um it's it's a little different um, level than what um, usually have on when we talk about different businesses, but it's so eye opening because people don't think about the things that are breaking in their business because they're not looking through, they're not finding that broken cog, they're 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 just trying to solve the problem, they're trying to work harder, they're trying to get better, they're trying to sell more, see more clients, or or you know fine tune the systems, but until they can go in and really dig and take apart their business, they're never going to be able to improve it, make it better, bigger, faster, stronger, and more profitable. Well, I'll tell you this. I mean, 81% of companies, they did a big poll, Forrester and other companies did a big poll and they pulled companies and said, what's holding you back? 81% responded, better process, better systems, better training, better knowledge. So obviously they're admitting it, right? That's the problem right, right. there. They don't, but they don't know how to do it. They're entrusting the wrong people. Um, mm. If you know, if we don't learn from history, we're doomed to repeat it, right? So right. we see a lot of people hire the wrong people, or their or their systems not right, or they're churning their staff, but yet they keep repeating the same mistakes over and over, hoping that the unicorn will show up, right? <laughs> hoping that hey, that person's going to be there, and it just doesn't happen. So then, when when does change happen, right? I mean, obviously, change happens when the when the pain when the is squeaky, greater, the fear of change itself, right? When That's the when squeaky wheel gets oiled, right? I'll tell you, and that's what happens. Then they come to us and they say, Brian, can you do this in, in about two days? We need change, right? <laughs> you know? Yesterday. So, yesterday. Yeah, we, I want it done yesterday and I need instant results. Yes. Yeah, that's uh, that's super. But it, it is so important. How often do you recommend that companies go through this process of, of I mean, it's usually when something really gets big and, you know, they have to go through it. But is there a um, an opportunity every every year, every three years, every five years. How often should a company really look at their systems and processes the way you, you have? Know, 
I would look at it every, you know, every year. I mean, we have people that are on retainer. You know, we talk to them weekly, some people quarterly. But as far as one of these deep dives, I mean, I would do it yearly. Things are changing so quickly. New systems are coming out all the time. There's really no heavy lifting anymore. We have a like a proprietary sales tool that we use that's custom engineered. You can't do it out of the box, but it's very, very quick for us to implement it. We have the best team mm -hmm. available. And there's really no downtime. The migration is very simple. So when it comes to evaluating these things, it's, it's like, you know, when do you check your oil? Right. right. You, know, you want to make sure your car on. runs. <laughs> Abs yeah, ex exactly. <laughs> so be proactive. I mean, my wife is amazing. She's checking the oil all the time. We have a generator in the back. You know, if we have a power outage, she's servicing it because you never know. Right. So it's always about being proactive and, and looking at your business as hey, this is my kid. I mean, I take him for a physical every year, you know, wow. to make sure everything is, 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 is right. You know, we take him to the dentist every, you know, what is every, six I can't months. remember. Yeah. Six months or whatever it is. Right have it down as a recurring event on your calendar. I mean, you owe it to your staff, you owe it to your, your stockholders, you owe it to your customers. You know, that makes total sense because if you're not making, if you're not keeping the engine running smoothly, it's not going to continue to perform for you. So that's, that's super valuable way. And thinking of your business as that moving engine with all the parts or what's that commercial that says, uh, there's 810 parts in the transmission or something. And, you know, you got to, I mean, you have 800 parts in your business and, and making sure it's all fine tuned and, and moving at the best, uh, best speed well, is, is the and best. And I'll tell answer. you this. It, yeah. And I'll tell you this, Marcia, you know, we don't have all the answers, right? We have a core skills, John and I, we have a team behind us, but there are times where, you know, we'll refer business to some of our partners because it's not in our wheelhouse. Right. Mm -hmm. But the beauty, beautiful thing is we can definitely identify we're well-versed in identifying these areas. And, you know, most of the time I'll say 75% of the time we're able to perform that function. But if we don't, we have a great support team in, in behind us that we can refer them to. So I don't want this coming across as of course, we're, you know, we have all the answers, right. but, uh, you know, but if I we don't, that, we're smart enough to know that. And I, and I think the challenge is, is that you have a much better insight. Consultants, people coming in from the outside, you know, can see better than the person that's knee deep in the, in the process. It's that you can't see the forest through the trees kind of thing. And you can because you're looking at it from the outside before you dive in on it. So good stuff. All right, so Brian, where can listeners find out more about you and your processes and getting that broken cog fixed? Yeah, onebrokencog.com, that's uh, O-N-E, right? Onebrokencog.com, you can email us at results at onebrokencog.com, uh, you know, results, because that's what we do. I mean, this is not just theoretical, this is the metaphorical, this is the real deal, right? This is the epitome of excellence, it's the apex of awesome. This is the personification of precision, right? So, you know, we definitely, uh, you will see the needle move, we, we guarantee that results happen. And that's why you can reach us at results at onebrokencog.com. Love it. Love it. Great, great marketing in the words that you use and representing the company represents exactly what you do. And the results are what is the transformation at the end. Love it. It's all that matters, Fantastic. you know? Fantastic. Great. Well, listeners, um, I hope you found an idea or two to put into your business that will help you be more profitable. And I really encourage you to think about doing that deep dive once a year to make sure everything's running at the best speed because, wow, what a really valuable tool that you can have to get your business engine moving faster and, and long, last or long, lasting longer if I can get my mouth to work. Uh, so thanks, Brian. We appreciate that. But uh, hey, considering what's happened to businesses over the past year plus, um, it's now more important than ever to create your own profit plan so that you too can have a thriving business. And I've got six easy action tips that you can put into your business immediately that will make a great impact on it. And I encourage you to go pick that up at failproofbiz, that's B-I-Z dot com. And as always, we'd love to hear your uh, questions or feedback or even ideas for future shows. So please subscribe and comment on today's show so that way you can find out what's going to happen in the future. So you can always catch Profit with a Plan on any of your favorite podcast players. And we're looking forward to more great profitable information on next week's show. So until then, make your plans and profit with them. Thanks, Brian. Thank you.